The Drop Scene by John Hobart Conter I had at all times a restless propensity for practical jokes, but I have lived long enough to find that, like young chickens, they always come home to roost. Experience is a stern disciplinarian. She is, nevertheless, the nurse of wisdom, and but for her sage lessons, how often should I have disgraced my grey hairs by frolics which were once dear to my heart, and which I have only relinquished because I so frequently found that they left either a sting or a bitter behind them. Propensities and antipathies are merely converse qualities of our moral nature, both equally difficult to subdue. It is perhaps impossible to struggle against either with any certainty of success, until the actual cautery of experience has been long enough applied to deaden the one or to correct the other. My propensities in early life were always active. There was a natural vehemence in my moral temperament, which I found it scarcely possible to control, and both in mind and body I felt a restless impatience for action, which was perpetually involving me in some difficulty or danger. Nothing could exceed the delight which I took in the execution of a practical joke, and to praise my dexterity in an acquirement so perfectly unexclusive was at once to open the nearest passage to my heart. With me this propensity was an absolute monomania. I was, however, cured of my fits of agreeable delirium, without being subjected to the discipline of a shorn crown or a straight waistcoat. I have made up my mind, as a penance for past folly, to record my own shame in telling how I was cured of my volatile propensities. It is certainly no very pleasant thing to provoke a laugh against oneself, but as years have somewhat blundered the edge of my sensibility, and deadened the sensitiveness of my perceptions of ridicule, I shall endeavour to indulge the reader with five minutes' amusement, though at my own expense. I was born at a village in Staffordshire, in the vicinity of numerous cull pits, into many of which I had descended with that eager thirst of curiosity so prevalent in young and ardent minds. To me the scene was new and inspiring, and when I gazed upon the wonders beneath the earth, I derived from them a greater zest in contemplating the wonders above it. I took infinite delight in listening to the superstitious legends of Goblins Damned, so readily and gravely related by the old pitmen, and these subterranean tenements were the frequent resort of my holiday hours. As I was of an active and buoyant temperament, excitement with me was the one thing needful, the ne plus ultra of moral enjoyment, and that particular excitement occasioned by the plan and execution of a practical jest was above all things what I most dearly loved. This was in truth but a childish predilection. Nevertheless it grew up with the man, so that though in my adolescent years I could truly say that I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, yet I could not predicate of myself that when I became a man I put away childish things. Matrimony, it was thought, would sober my restless and mercurial habits, and I was accordingly soon drawn within the circumscribed boundaries of a domestic circle. I was still, however, for a joke, in spite of connubial bliss, and my wife, who was as good-humoured and affectionate as she was beautiful, only laughed at my hallucinations, and persuaded her friends to do the like, which gave a stimulus to my habits, and this increased momentum soon brought them to a climax. On the eve of some great day, as I well remember, the annual fair of a neighbouring town, or something as eventful, the workmen of a large pit near my rustic dwelling had obtained leave to work during the night, in order that they might be free to enjoy the fun of the fair next day. I accordingly determined to descend into the pit at witching time of night, in the character of a goblin, and terrify these dark rustics in order to quicken their relish for the next day's pleasures. I prepared the necessary disguise and tied it up in a dark bandana, 
and having arranged with a friend to assist my descent into the Valley of Black Diamonds, awaited that much dreaded hour when churchyards yawn and graves give up their dead with most restless impatience. I almost counted the moments, but time, as if to mock my anxiety, seemed to have folded his wings and, like a wounded snake, drag his slow length along. Anxiety is never comatose. I had therefore no desire to sleep, for the fever of anticipation had got so strong a hold upon me that my pulse outran the ticking of the clock by at least sixty in a minute. The hand of the dial, to my very great joy, at length pointed to three quarters past eleven, when I sallied forth and found my friend at the mouth of the pit awaiting my arrival. It was a beautiful moonlight night. The heavens were starred and cloudless. In spite of my sinister project, I could not be insensible to the loveliness of the scene around me. The blue vault of heaven was studded with innumerable stars, sparkling with light and life, radiant in celestial beauty, and recording in a language mute indeed, but universally intelligible, the omnipotence of him who hung their glories in the firmament as the paragons of his creation. Where can we so legibly read the power and wisdom of the Godhead as in the language of the skies, when night is hanging out her lamps on the wide battlements of heaven, and its azure plains stream with the effulgence of their glories? There is a vital loveliness in the clear, calm moonlight, which at once lifts the soul to the God of its existence, and makes it exult in the consciousness that it is a part of that mighty scheme of motion and intelligence by which it is surrounded, and in which it is absorbed. The beauty of the scene still lingers upon my memory. Nor was I so entirely engrossed by the anticipations of a droll adventure as to have abandoned all relish for beauties which have never failed to kindle in my bosom the most impressive emotions of wonder and admiration. The mouth of the pit was encircled by a rude rail. The mode of descent was by a rope fastened to a windlass, at the end of which was a piece of strong chain terminated by a crossbar of iron. As I had been accustomed in my boyish days to descend into these dark and dismal excavations by a similar mode of conveyance, I had no fears upon the present occasion in repeating the freak. My friend placed himself at the windlass in order to regulate my progress and having first dropped my bundle into the pit, I fixed my feet firmly on the bar at the end of the chain and commenced my somewhat perilous descent. The harsh creaking of the crazy machine, as the tightened rope gradually uncoiled from the wooden cylinder round which it was rolled, seemed amid the silence of midnight like the muttering of unquiet spirits doomed for a stated time to walk by night when upon a corner of the moon there hangs a vaporous drop profound, and a tremor of something like dread came over me when light was entirely excluded from my view, and the very blackness of darkness fearfully closed in around me. My progress appeared to be extremely rapid, so much so that I felt a sudden faintness steal upon me. But this soon passed. Yet when I considered that my safety depended upon the strength of a rope scarcely more than an inch in diameter, I confess I felt for a moment that my life was held upon a very uncertain tenure, and the throbbings of my heart became almost painfully accelerated. It was by this time so dark that I could not distinguish the sides of the shaft, while the small fragments of earth which occasionally fell as they were disturbed by my progress sounded in my ears with a loud and terrifying indistinctness, like the multiplied repercussions of echoes amid the vaults of a cemetery. I had not been long on the rope, when to my great surprise I found my progress suddenly arrested. I waited for a few moments with much impatience, under the idea that some impediment had arisen in the machine above. But finding after a lapse of several minutes that the rope on which I was balanced still continued stationary, I concluded that I had reached the bottom of the shaft and prepared to quit the chain. I forebode shouting to my friend above lest I should alarm the pitmen and thus at once expose myself to their coarse raillery and mar my own diversion. 
I now became keenly sensible that I had done a very foolish thing in venturing by nights into a pit which I had not examined by day, and some very unpleasant apprehensions began to steal over me. However, summoning my resolution, and persuading myself that I must be within a yard at most of terra firma, I slid down the chain until my hands grasped the crossbar, when, to my utmost consternation and horror, my feet rested upon nothing and I found myself swinging with the most fearful oscillation in the empty air. I stretched myself to my utmost length, but in vain. I still swung, and there appeared to be a supernatural power in the dark void around me, dragging me down into the black gulf beneath. The whole mass of my blood seemed as it were to circulate only downward, and I became for the first time most painfully sensible of my own gravitation. That mysterious principle by which all material objects are attracted to one common center appeared to be increased a thousandfold, and I already fancied that I saw my brains whitening the black pavement below. My blood curled. I strove to regain my former position on the chain, but found myself unable to raise my body to a sufficient elevation to enable me to grasp it above the bar from which I was suspended. My arms were stretched to their utmost tension, and I felt all the pangs of luxation. My sensations were appalling. It seemed as if an enormous weight were attached to my extremities, and the most fearful noises met my ears, as though the dismal ministers of doom were exulting in the near possession of their victim. It was clear that I could not long maintain my hold. I shuddered. My temples were bedewed with drops of bitter agony. My eyes, stretched open to their utmost extent, could still distinguish nothing in the pitchy void around me. My tongue was parched with the violence of my exertions. How did I curse my folly in having wantonly brought myself into such jeopardy? What a situation! To hang between time and eternity, about to drop from the one into the other, to quit reality for uncertainty, to be suspended over a dark and horrible pit where no eye could behold my sufferings but his, to whom darkness and light are both alike, about to perish without one expression of consolation or of sympathy from her who was the depository of my tenderest affections, though I had so often laughed at her gentle rebukes whenever she attempted to check the exuberance of my wayward will. Reflections rushed like a whirlwind through my brain. Though the period of my involuntary suspension had been but a few minutes, as many painful thoughts crowded into my mind as under ordinary circumstances would have filled up the melancholy void of years. I remembered my child and groaned, Thou wilt soon be fatherless, my boy, and thy father. Oh God, what a reflection! Tears, scalding and bitter, streamed down my heated cheeks, but I had no hand to dash them off, for although I felt destruction to be near, I still clung to life with that instinctive energy which is common alike to the coward and the brave in the hour of extremity. I thought, for the first time, upon my iniquities, and felt that I had a fearful reckoning to make with him before whom I was about to appear, but for which I was altogether unprepared. How should I meet that omnipresent eye which had read my inmost thoughts, and therefore knew but too well that I had rather been a worshipper of the idols of this world than of him who founded it upon the seas and prepared it upon the floods? A pang pierced through my bosom as my mind confusedly reverted to my spiritual insecurity. The possibility of what my futurity might be flashed like a stream of lightning through my brain. I shouted to my friend above, in vain. He heard me not. Feeling my strength fast deserting me, I concentrated all my energies in one resolved effort, and lifting myself above the bar, made a plunge at the chain. The endeavour was unavailing. I missed my hold, and from the violence of the exertion was swung round and round with a velocity that almost deprived me of consciousness. I now hung by one hand over the dark abyss, 
I felt that I had but a few moments between life and death. My brain reeled, I put up a short prayer to heaven, and scarcely conscious of the action, unclasped the bar and dropped into the terrible abyss. I was all but insensible when I fell, yet a something of consciousness remained to me, and it appeared to my fading fancy that I was some time whirling in the air before I met the earth. My senses now utterly deserted me. When I recovered them, I found myself supported on the smutty knee of a pitman, who was chafing my temples with fingers that had not known the wholesome application of water since their abdominal ablution just five days before. I gazed around me with an expression of stupefied amazement. I looked up and saw the awful chain swinging scarcely a yard above my head, and upon putting myself in the position which I had just so fearfully quitted, I discovered, to my inexpressible surprise and mortification, that from the distance between my toe and the ground, when my body was at its utmost stretch, I had fallen from the prodigious height of two inches.